Hello everyone, welcome to another interview series uh, where we talk to companies who have hired bootcamp graduates, particularly um, Code Chrysler's graduates to discuss their experience, um, the, the, the benefits and the challenges they've experienced um, hiring bootcamp graduates. My name is Buki Adajobi. I'm a career coach here at Code Chrysler's. I am your co-host with Paul Roberts. Hi, I'm Paul. I am a Japan-based IT recruiter. Yes, and today we are speaking with Christian from Evolani. Um, Christian has, um, you know, made the effort to give us his time today. Uh, Christian, if you can please tell us a little bit about yourself um, and Evolani. Sure. Uh, my name is Christian Forso. I'm from Canada. Uh, I've been in Japan since 2003. Um, this is my fourth company I've started and definitely the most successful one in that time. Uh, about Evolani, we were founded in March 2018, so we're almost six years old. I think our corporate birthday is next week. So six Happy years birthday. Happy birthday in advance. Thank you very much. Uh, and we build uh, basically mini apps inside Line. So inspired by WeChat in China, which sort of created that world's first super app. So in WeChat, mm. you can chat with family and friends, or mm -hmm. you can order KFC you can reserve a table at a restaurant. You can do all sorts mm. of things. Uh, we took that as inspiration and we build mini apps inside Line. So our clientele can use those mini apps for much of the same purposes as you know, WeChat. Uh, mm. Reservation management, uh, e-commerce. Um, what else? Customer service, customer success are quite kind of popular. Uh, as well as coupons and communication, games, lots of different things. Cool. Nice. And how big? So your sixth birthday in in a week's time, right? Um, about, yeah. In about a week. And so how big is the team right now? The company uh, as a whole and also the dev team? Sure. Our uh, company as a whole, we're about 60 people. And our development team is a, it's about 25 to 30. Um, mm -hmm. It really depends sort of where you draw the line. But uh, total dev team is about 25 to 30. Okay. Where you draw the line as in? Um, you know, within our sort of development umbrella, we do have, uh, for example, QA. Um, mm. QA, they're not coders okay. per se, but they're still underneath our development umbrella because they provide, you know, of course, that first line support. Um, mm. We also include some technical project managers who are non-coders underneath the dev umbrella as well. So depending okay. on, you know, how precise you are with the sort of job titles or the, well, the job requirements, yeah, we can say 25 to 30. I see. Okay, cool. Um, so you've, you've already given us a breakdown of your engineering team um, out of the, or your development team. Um, out of that team, how many of them are either bootcamp graduates or, or mid-career um, transitioners? Sure. Um, pretty much 50% are uh, computer science grads, 45% are boot camp, and 5% are self-taught. Wow. Hmm. That is, now, wow, okay. Mid-career, um, just, hmm. to, just to con or clarify a little bit, um, from a sort of headhunting perspective, mid-career might be you know, somebody in their early to mid-30s looking to make a change. Uh, a lot of the boot camp grads that we hired, uh, they might have had one or two years, uh, for example, teaching English, but mm. I wouldn't really classify them as a mid-career uh, person. Mm. No. Okay. Why is that? Um, they're young. This is, in many cases, it's kind of the first career they've really studied for, they've really gone for. Mm. Um, mm. So in, like, in that regard... I don't really, I can't really classify them as mid-career. Um, mm. I also personally believe that people just in general, like modern trends and workflow, everybody has two or three careers in them. Yeah. Mm. Right? Um, mm. I've been an architect. I've been a headhunter. I've been a, well, designer. I've been a couple different things. So, yeah. Yeah, I think Paul and I have also had a couple of well Paul's mostly been in, in tech, but you've done many multiple things in, in tech. 
Yeah, I, I guess I started out on the engineering side and then after coming to Japan, moved over to the recruitment side and now mm. dabble a bit bit more in the engineering side again. So, but yeah, I think for the way of the world these days, it's, I don't think you're going to expect doing the same thing for, for the next 40 years if you, when you come out of college. Yeah, yeah, same here. Um, yeah, so what what are your, I mean, what have been your observations with hiring not only guess I'll put them as the non-CS background graduates because then you have you have the self-taught bootcamp graduates and then you have the CS degree holders. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, can you uh, clarify that question? Your, your general observations when you compare oh. the two. So basically, what's your thoughts? What are your thoughts on bootcamp graduates? Hmm. Um... In general, they, they arrive with a very high sense of practical skills in terms of web development. So mm. we're not trying to reinvent any wheels on the tech side. We are, at our core, a web dev company. Um, so they do arrive with these practical front-end skills. Uh, at the same time, though, when we venture more into um, you know, chat GPT or generative AI, or when we're working more with heavy data sets, um, I mm. found that a lot of boot camp grads have difficulty with that. Um, mm. They didn't start engineering with a low level programming language, and they don't oftentimes have that algorithmic sense of thinking. So, structuring mm. a database is often more difficult. Um, it's not impossible by any means. And a lot of our boot camp grads have really raised up into more kind of senior engineering positions. Uh, but I can say it's often more difficult for them mm. to learn these core skills. Um, mm. Bootcamp grads that, and this is just a general observation, uh, if they had a university, like a STEM university degree, or mm. maybe they were good in math and physics in high school, I find that it's, uh, they do have an easier time sort of acclimatizing to being an engineer at a core technology company. Hmm. Okay. Is that something you, you look at when you are considering potential um, candidates? Um, whether or not they have a STEM background? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it does come into play. Um, it's not as important as maybe I made it out to be. I think it, it, it helps me judge whether or not somebody can work at a technology company. Uh, there's hmm. a lot of engineers in the world, you know, who they could be working on sort of the ad tech side or the design side. They could be working in consumer goods. Um, but our product is technology and we need hmm. candidates that can really think in those terms. Um, so if somebody has a STEM background or like an early childhood interest or proclivity for math or physics in high school, it really helps determine whether or not they can handle a job in a core technology company. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's, How, yeah. So I was going to say for uh, for those who've kind of overcome that initial limitation, what has been the the path to that? Has it been on the job training or learning from the team? Has it been kind of online, you know, theory and getting you know the the so many different um, online resources for for understanding theory and other things? Mm -hmm. what, what have been the 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 key maybe success factors for people who've kind of overcome that initially? Great question. It is definitely a combination of sort of uh, teamwork. So the team helping out senior engineers lending a hand. Um, but it's also taking Harvard CS50. It's also getting on Code Wars or Lead Code and doing blind mm. 75 style questions. Mm. Um, it's asking ChatGPT for the answers to those types of questions. Um, of course, like in an ideal situation, the engineer, the programmer is really working out these problems for themselves. But it's not bad taking a peek at how mm. the answer is derived. Mm. So, mm. I mean, this really does sort of fast track the process. Um, I think it's unrealistic to expect uh, not only boot camp, but it's unrealistic to expect most engineers to achieve these sort of fang company like Facebook. Apple, Amazon mm. level company. Mm. It's unrealistic mm. to think, but it is good to sort of 
kind of see what they do, see how they function. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And have you been able to spot in the interview process the people that had the tendency to exhibit that kind of behavior later? Is that something you're looking for when you're interviewing and, and how do you try to spot that? My interview process is honestly, Paul, it's remarkably simple. Okay. It's, it's very it really interesting. Is. Even when I was headhunting, um, my interview process was simple. I already have a resume. I don't need to quiz people on a resume. Mm. We're not talking about memory here. Um, when I was a headhunter, I'd introduce people to people, not people to jobs. Mm. So what it comes down to is I really want to find the right people that work well together. So mm. the process starts off. The first sort of question I, I need to answer to myself is, do I want to work with this person? Yes or no? And if it's yes, can this person do the job or learn the job in a reasonable amount of time? And right. if that's a yes, do they want the job? And that's basically it. Um, but before I even grant that interview, I'm looking at their GitHub account and I'm, I'm not an engineer. I can't read code. I don't know if it's good or bad, but I can tell consistency. Hmm. And one of the biggest tips I can give to any bootcamp graduate is to keep your GitHub minty green and consistent until you get that first job. Because if mm. somebody interviews with me and I see that maybe they graduated in December, but they haven't committed anything to GitHub in two or three months. And I asked them, what have you been doing? They said, well, I've been looking for a job. And I go, well, we, I, I can't take that risk on you. I need somebody that is committed to code. Right. Mm. Ex excellency will come after consistency. Mm. So mm. if somebody comes to me with a resume, uh, with sort of a STEM education, or, you know, I'm looking through maybe some other certifications or, uh, you know, I hired somebody that won a math Olympiad and I thought that was really cool. Um, then I, I can kind of gauge the level of mm. potential within mm. that. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I remember when I started at CC, you were one of the first um, hiring managers or CTOs that I spoke with. And I remember, you know, I, re I don't remember if it was from you or one of the graduates who interviewed with you and you mentioned, you know, looking for the green. And for me, that was an indication like you have to keep coding. People might not read you know, look into the details of your code or of your project, but that consistency, those green commits need to be public for people mm -hmm. to see that this is not a hobby and it, mm -hmm. it's a passion. And I think that was one, that was another thing that stood out for me in your interview process or conversations that you've had with, with some of the graduates is how do you, you know, how does a bootcamp graduate potentially communicate the passion for the career path? to mm -hmm. a potential, you know, potential hiring manager. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I might, I might I, have to steal minty green as a, minty green. as a catchphrase. I like it. Go for it. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's, um, you know, even candidates that don't succeed with us. And honestly, I do get a lot of, in I do interview a lot of candidates. And quite often I am encouraging them to kind of keep it minty green, to keep that on and, you know, trying to give them tips, you know, sort of where to look, you know, the old headhunter and me coming back. Um, right. But yeah, the minty green is the, is the tip that does seem to make the biggest impact. So please, yeah, mm. feel away, Paul. Okay. Yep. Okay. And how, how important are portfolios for, for junior engineers? I think they, they, there's a sort of stress level of building a portfolio. What should be on it? Should I be learning new things or tinkering with the portfolio? Do people look at it? Is it just for front end jobs and not so important in other areas? What, what kind of thoughts might you have on, on that area? I, um, got some strong feelings about this one, Paul. Uh, okay. <laughs> Fire ahead. Um, I personally, I do like portfolios that might be like mm. sort of the architect or, or the designer, because that's how you present your work. Um, nine times out of 10 though, I, I kind of have to give feedback 
on the portfolio. Um, a lot of young engineers, especially front-end engineers, they're, they're using their portfolio as this sort of venue to practice new tricks. So you have these really kind of brusque or abstract CS, CSS transitions and the mm. portfolio the, itself is really difficult to navigate. Mm. Um, you know, the, the menu bar might be taped to the side or hidden or only viewable like upon scroll. Um, mm. Lots of strange animations because, and I, I totally understand it. You know, these are young engineers, young coders really trying to show what they can do. Um, but that's akin to an unreadable resume. You know, you've mm. read tens of thousands of resumes in your life, I imagine. And mm. Absolutely. Right? And if the format is this kind of the standard format that we've unconsciously agreed upon, we can burn through resumes really quickly. But if they start mm. throwing strange abstract designs and putting information out of accepted order, the resume becomes just a jumble of information. Um, right. That's what I find for a lot of portfolio sites. And I have a couple links on like Dribble and Behance. And I say, for your portfolio site, really keep it simple. Make it as navigable as possible. Here are some examples that I kind of like. Um, when it gets to the, if you want to show off, put that within sort of the work that you've done. You know, link to right. GitHub, mm. link to the student projects. Because mm. anybody reading your portfolio, we are, you know, if we've already made it there, we are going to click on some of those links. And that's where you can really kind of explore a little bit. Mm. Um, like the mm. portfolio itself, I do appreciate a nice, simple, snack, clean, simple menu at the top. It's fixed. You have a bit of bio. You might have your resume. You have some sample projects. Um, mm. Just a one pager. It doesn't need to be this yeah, Byzantine sort of <laughs> website puzzle game. Yeah. 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 yeah that's, it, it's interesting that you, you know, that you relate it to, to the resume. I mean, I always saw them hand in hand, you know, if you're, if you're going to have a portfolio, um, then, then I have one, but I never really, you know, I, I never really looked at it as, use use the uh, the the portfolio as a canvas and then within the canvas have different links to connect to what you can do from you know from a design from a design um a design point of view as a, as a developer but yeah many many people fall into that trap of trying to have everything right on there the on page. the portfolio yeah on the front mm -hmm. page yeah yeah mm -hmm. hmm. interesting um, recent, not recently, a couple of years ago, you, you started, I think you were one of the people who I spoke with, um, that started a, a, a kind of a, instead of a probation, a probationary period, but a, like a short-term contract to give people that a short-term trial contract, mm -hmm. if that's what I would call it to potentially lead to full-time employment instead of a probationary period. And we had a, we had a graduate partake in that, maybe some other people, I'm not sure. But I'm just out of curiosity, what was the, what are you still doing it? And what was the, the learning points or your observation from that um, hiring process? Uh, okay, these are views my own, not necessarily views of my company. I should throw that out there. Oh, I'm, okay. This comes back to the headhunter in me as well, maybe. I'm not a, a fan of these sort of periods. I like to jump mm. people into full-time employment quicker. I think it's I think it's a good way to establish trust and rapport very early. Um, mm. We set up that period, that probationary period, because I'll be honest, we were a small company at the time and we were sort of burned by candidates who couldn't actually do the job, mm. right? So they managed to sort of sneak by us in one way or another, our tests, things like that. Mm. Um, mm. And in Japan, you know, the, the law does protect the employee. And we were left mm. in a situation where we had an underperforming employee that was mm. kind of dragging maybe other people down as well. 
Mm. and not much we can do. So we did switch to this probationary period. Um, we mm. saw it as a way to, you know, we didn't want to do the whole, you start off as an intern approach, mm. thought, mm. um, which is it's fairly typical as well. We saw it as, you know, maybe a happy medium, you know, a step above intern, but not quite full time. Uh, we mm. still do it. Um, it's worked out for us since then. And we actually haven't had problems, you know, using this approach. Um, mm. That said, this approach, uh, you know, it is mainly for younger candidates, to be honest. Mm. Uh, oh, okay. More, yep. So in the case of established professionals, we can bypass this case by case. Mm. Um, but it is a case by case sort of situation. Mm. I, should, uh, I should clarify <laughs> as well. Um, our trial periods are not six months. Mm. Uh, they're uh, between two and three months. Mm -hmm. And they are paid a full-time salary at that. Salary doesn't actually change. Um, mm, okay. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all the benefits are there, uh, mm. except the full-time designation on the contract. I see. Yeah. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the the question we were discussing actually we were discussing two questions. One mm -hmm. was what was the reason why you have um, why that is a contract that's offered to you know, maybe the, the younger candidate versus, you know, more more professionally, career-wise, senior candidates? Um, it is, it's not that black and white. Um, okay. Some sort of senior candidates do, they have to have that contract as well. Um, mm. Two of our recent senior hires were kind of within that situation. Okay. Um, but it is more common for kind of junior candidates. Okay. Is there a distinctive, like, is there, I guess, what are the factors considered when offering, you know, to determine if they, if they get the contract versus not? Um, team fit is always important in sort of every role, mm. but I would argue that it's even more important at a tech company for a young engineering team to really fit together. Hmm. Somebody 35, 40 years old, they come with experience. They come with the ability to maybe navigate certain office po political issues or kind of navigate certain problems. Um, mm. Our engineering team, though, this oftentimes this is their first job in engineering, even right. for our mm. CS graduates. Um, mm. well, I, I need to know that they can you know, really work together. Uh, Paul, you've been here for 25 years, I guess. Pretty much, yeah. Do you still have friends from your first job? Yes. Yeah, I do as well. <laughs> and I do as I, well. I taught, right? Right, Rufi? Like, I, yeah, yeah. I spent six months teaching English in Shizuoka, and I've got a handful of friends from those six months. Mm. Um, so I really need to consider that because our engineering team mm. is on the younger side. And I want them to be able to establish that rapport, that trust, and hopefully even that sort of lifetime bond afterwards. Mm. Right? Mm. So that's why mm. it's, I need to be a little bit more strict on that. Mm. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Um, then the other thing I, um, I actually wanted to say was I, when I heard of that, um, you know, that approach to, to hiring, I actually thought it was great. Because we we're discussing Paul and I earlier that it felt like a great opportunity or a great way for companies to consider bootcamp graduates. Because what we've noticed, or what I've noticed, was that you know there is that hesitation because you see the resume, there is no professional experience as a developer in a company on their resume. So the company is thinking, uh, if I hire this person on a full-time contract. I can't fire them. But then with this contract probationary period, the company is still, legally speaking, they have a way out. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Um, if it opens the door for other companies sort of hiring bootcamp grads, please, I, I hope they do similar. Um, for me though, it, it goes back to the headhunting days where working with a client that would say, no, we mm. don't offer full-time. It is a little bit more difficult. 
Right. So mm. I was thinking more from from that perspective. But you know, actually, in practice, uh, it's worked out well for us, and it has allowed us to take more ch- chances that we wouldn't have taken. Mm. Mm. Um, I'll be honest. Sometimes it doesn't work out, but that's why that mm. confidence is there. Right. Mm. Because it has opened doors for people who wouldn't have gotten that chance, and I think Buki are absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, any questions from you, Paul? Um, I guess I'm wondering a little bit about sort of the interview process. How mm. well prepared uh, do you feel bootcamp grads are? For both the, the sort of the technical side of things and then the the non technical, the sort of behavioral, um, soft skills interviews compared to people coming from other backgrounds like experienced engineers or other people. Arguably, on the soft skills side, um, in my experience, I think equal to or better than CS grads. Hmm. I think there's. Maybe it's the way boot camps teach. I think they really instill a sense of co-working and community. Mm. Uh, maybe, mm. maybe it's the types of people that boot camps, boot camps accept as students that plays into that as well. Um, CS graduates, they get into CS because they want to be an engineer. They're probably pretty smart. You know, in mm. high school, maybe they got good grades. Um, a lot of them want to work in gaming, of mm. course. Mm. But... Um, by the time they graduate those four years, they are, they're moved to a country or a company and they don't have that peer network maybe to fall back on initially. So it does mm. take them often a little bit more time to sort of feel part of that team. Um, mm. Where boot camp grads, no, they, they jump from one community right into another. Right. And, mm. Yeah, I think the ability to generate a rapport is—it's. I mean, it's excellent, basically. Mm. Um, sorry, what was the second part of that question? <laughs> um, good question. Uh, yeah, I guess in sort of interview oh, so, yeah. uh, preparation, um, yeah. you know, sometimes people tend they send you know ninety percent of the preparation goes into you know leak code questions and those kind of things, and then the the that, you know what salary range you're expecting there's a blank stare because they're not prepared for the the real world type of questions that yeah. just kind of go along with the, or opposed to the technical side um i tend to if i'm looking at a candidate as those kind of three main criteria um you know do i want to work with them can they do the job do they want the job um, mm. i'm also looking at 50 50 sort of potential and soft skills or interpersonal skills my interviews are arguably very casual Mm. Um, Mm. maybe jarringly so for some types of of candidate who really expected to be hit hard with deep sort of tech questions right Um, i'm you know i want to get to know the people overall Mm. my Mm. job is to effectively build an engineering team who work well together and who trust each other you know, that those hard skills will come after. Um, mm. And I have this very practical range. Boot camp grads, nine out of ten times, fit within that range. Mm. So there's no surprises there. Computer science grads, the range is massive. But boot, right. camp, boot camp, it's, it is pretty tight. So, mm. Mm. so in terms of... Yeah, like in terms of candidate preparation, I'm hmm, it's not too much goes into it on both sides. <laughs> mm, mm. Okay, great. Mm. Mm. It, it's interesting because I in this current cohort that we have going through the immersive, we have about two two relatively new CS graduates who've decided to enroll in the boot camp because they want to have that kind of hands-on experience mm. working on a on a dev team and i wonder if that's a, if that's a, a trend or a pattern that would continue um over time because more and more people are realizing that you know to be a good i want to say good developer to if but to effectively work on a development team you need to be able to work 
in a team. And that's different from working on solo project yourself. Um, I mean, you would know these trends far better than I do, but I have met a handful of computer science grads that went to boot camps as well. Um, I've met candidates that actually, for example, they did computer science maybe five or six years ago. And to and then they took another job, maybe sales or marketing related. And to get mm. back in mm. the coding, they went to a boot camp. Um, yeah. mm. And I find them to be excellent candidates. They do come out with best of both worlds. Um, mm. That ability to generate kind of quick rapport with teammates, those soft skills, while having at least some experience or a practical mindset in computer science and sort of, well, development from a low level uh, language sort of focus. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. okay. Yeah. So, a question on uh, perhaps uh, maybe work style. Are, is it um Are you on site? Are you hybrid? Are you full remote? And how does that affect onboarding, especially for junior people? We are in office. Okay. Um, we are. Uh, we're in office. Um, we have been for six years. We didn't experiment with full work from home. We do give one work from home day per week, but I'd hardly call that hybrid, I think, in this sort of day and age. Um, hmm. It does limit some of the you know candidates we might have access to. Um, we hmm. do get a lot of you know, candidates. They do look pretty good, um, but maybe they live in you know, Sapporo. Maybe they live, well, a couple in Kyoto. Um, mm. But mm. the thing is, we really built this team that works closely together. You know, they they go out, like, after work. They spend time together. They visit each other's houses. They do these sort of activities together. Um, mm. Being mm. full remote in that system just wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Um, mm. uh, in terms of, yeah, we haven't had too many issues in terms of onboarding because, again, it is in office. Right. So, that's it. Mm. Yeah. This this is a bit late in in the in the in, in the conversation, but sure. I I remembered I wanted to ask. I was curious. You said this is your fifth company you started. Fourth, fourth. Yep. This is very late in the. But it just it just came up because I really wanted to ask. What were the other companies? Um, <laughs> and. <laughs> I can tell you, I, I, I'll give you a quick overview and then I'll tell you what I learned. Okay. Um, okay. From company. The first one was a collaborative architecture platform where sort mm. of people that mm. were looking to maybe design their own house could collaborate with uh, university students. There was gamification elements okay. and a couple other interesting things involved. Uh, what I learned is uh, it's maybe not technically legal to make such a platform. Uh, it, was a little, <laughs> it was a little bit gray area. Um, okay. It, it, it's not, Is it, that it's around like a, architectural standards or something like that? I imagine. Yeah, well, that, that was kind of it. It's uh, You can't have... Uh, Licensing or... Yeah, like uh, in Canada, uh, in the States and in many places around the world, anybody can design their own house. Yeah. You have to have... You have to in have Nigeria, yes. Yeah. Right? To get it built is, is different. An engineer has to stamp the drawings, but we hit a potential issue. Even students giving sort of advice was potentially problematic moving forward. Um, next business I started was sort of a business intelligence platform. Mm -hmm. This was great during uh, kind of at the, the tail end of Lehman shock. Um, mm -hmm. We were unable to here are the big funding we needed, uh, built a great team. And that team went on to do really good things. Um, not me. <laughs> it took me a while to sort of get back into it. Um, but the team went on to do some really great things really quickly. Uh, what I found mm. out there is prototypes can go a long way. Um, we were able to recoup our losses on that by selling sort of ideas and prototypes to companies that mm. were interested in what we were trying to do. Mm. Um, so that, that was kind of an interesting learning experience. Um, after that, I guess my next company, I really bootstrapped it myself and it was an adventure travel platform. 
Um, oh. So okay. I really wanted to help people explore the world's esoteric places. Um, mm. Two main things I learned there. Number one, you can have a killer lead-off marketing campaign. You know, I, I set up this viral campaign and we got sort of top page of Reddit and crashed our site for a little bit. <laughs> but that didn't... I couldn't convert. So the second mm. thing I learned from that is conversion is a completely different game altogether. Right. Um, I also learned, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not an engineer, so I couldn't really build the site. I was relying mm. on some higher third party developers, and they did an amazing job. At the same time, some things you do need to change real time. Mm. And mm. I didn't have that ability. Um, right. That was, um, I don't know, in, in some ways, I still consider that fairly successful, just because, of course, I, I learned quite a bit. I had a lot of fun doing mm. it. Um, and businesses were interested. I just couldn't convert mm. on the consumer end. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Con conversion is something that I've also, you know, learned in the last half a year with trying to mm. launch the e-commerce uh, platform. So I, I completely, yeah, it, it's a struggle. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I imagine, would you, is it then safe to say that all of those experiences has informed how you run Evolani now and also potentially how you look at candidates to hire? Um, oh, ab I mean, absolutely. And I, I really need to say I don't run Evolani. Uh, I'm co-founder and I'm team builder. And in some cases I'm, I'm leader and I do a lot of various things. I have you know, a fair breadth of experience, like hyper generalism. Um, management is not one of my skills. <laughs> like, okay, interesting. The, um, um, I've never been successful with like being a good manager is sort of the minutiae, the details, the documentation. Mm. Um, I like to, people have asked me how I view sort of management and leadership. And the simplest answer I can give is. If you walk into the office and somebody spilled a cup of tea on the ground, a manager will document it. They'll put it on Slack, mm. they'll take photos, they'll assign people to take care of it. A leader mm. will look at that and say, it needs to get done now. They'll pick up the cup, they'll clean off the carpet and walk away. So mm. <laughs> in that regard, I mean, the breadth of experience I've had has hopefully made me a more sort of conscientious leader. Mm. Mm. But in terms of management, no, not at all. It's a yeah. fundamental inability in my mind. Mm. But that, that's interesting that you, you split those two into, you split that into two different parts, leadership and management. But I mean, I guess in my mind, I was thinking both of them combined. And it's also interesting because we had our previous guest speaker also, I mean, although he's the he's a CTO, um, we had Andrew. Um, he also did not think of himself as a as a manager per se in that so sense. I, so it's yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, but um, yeah. about I guess it was about a month or a month and a half ago. Uh, mm. The Open AI uh, Sam Alt. Mm. He was on a couple podcasts, and even he said he goes, "I'm a." I mean, he used you know rougher language than I'm going to use, but even he said he was, "I'm not a manager. Like, can't manage for anything." Um, and he drew like a, a distinction between the two as well. And I think mm. the distinction mm. between management and leadership has been, I mean, it's it's been accepted for, I don't know, since no, before. Of course, I, yeah. Mm. 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 Yeah. Interesting. Mm. Okay. Um, so we are coming to our time, you know, together, to the end of our time together. Are there any um, final thoughts or pointers that you would give uh, potential bootcamp graduates um, looking to start their job hunt or who are interested um, in Evolani, um, as well as companies who are looking to hire uh, software developers? Um, advice. Okay. First advice, I guess, for bootcamp grads, and I'll re reiterate what I said before about the GitHub, keep it minty green. Another reiteration would be uh, for a portfolio site, 
if you don't have one, it is okay. Um, if mm. you do have one, really keep it simple. Um, the next would be, and I guess Paul and myself, maybe we, we know this from being in Japan for so long or being recruiters previously, currently, network, get out there. Um, yeah. There's so many co-working spaces. I mean, even WeWork puts on events you know, quite often. Uh, it could be a focused or a niche networking event. It could be generalist or a hiring event. Um, but I recommend to a lot of candidates who don't quite, uh, they don't have what I'm looking for for Evelani, but I want to help them out anyway. Um, mm. And I'll give them just some lists that I've prepared over the years. Um, different places where they can look, but the thing is really get out there. Uh, start, yeah. mm. start building your network. Um, whoever you meet, add them on LinkedIn. Start posting on LinkedIn. Start being active. Um, mm. And I, I hope Paul will agree with me, even though this is against sort of the headhunting ethos. Uh, referral candidates are the best. Mm. Mm. If somebody refers, yep. so if Paul has a candidate and they refer somebody to Paul, I'm sure Paul would be very happy to meet them because referrals. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And when yep. you start, yeah, and when you start building that network doesn't matter what skill level level you're at or what type of job you're looking for when you start building that the referrals do start coming a little bit more easily information comes more mm -hmm. easily you can really establish mm -hmm. you know a career a lot more efficiently um mm -hmm. recommendation to companies i suppose um again 45 percent or sorry 40 percent of our staff our bootcamp grads, that's that's pretty good. We've had success with them. Uh, about corporate culture, I think uh, companies that really want to hire bootcamp grads, uh, they have to start building that corporate culture, I guess, from the ground up, and they have to make that corporate culture their own. Um, mm. I don't think a bootcamp grad would fit in with a traditional salaryman-style company. And... Mm. Because I really can't see them fitting in, I can't see the benefit for the company or for the the candidate for the bootcamp graduate. Um, mm. So I have recommended, you know, at times, you know, startup companies look for bootcamp grads. Likewise, bootcamp grads look for startup companies. It's a chance to really build that culture together. Um, great culture, great rapport, great team. You will have more mutual success sort of down the road. Mm. Mm. So. Great, thank you for that, Christian. Um, any any final any final um, points uh, from from you, Paul? Thoughts no. for, for questions? Nothing yeah. for me. No, I think we we covered a lot of really great areas. So thank you very much. Mm, thank you. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much, Christian. It's been a pleasure having you here. Um, thank you for your continued. Um, words of wisdom to our graduates because I know many of them reach out to you just to get your <laughs> yeah <laughs> your, your your thoughts on many things so thank you for that um, and uh, yeah and to the audience thank you very much for listening on um, this far um, and please feel free to keep it leave a comment uh, reach out to Christian if that's okay yep. yeah reach out to Christian Check out Evelani and what the amazing things you're doing. And we will see you in the next episode or on the next episode.